Good morning. That is a, a stirring song, isn't it? And uh, especially when we think of why we're singing it on this morning. So our, our hearts go out to the people of Ukraine on this special morning, and we'll be having more to say about that as we wear on. But right now, it says that this is the welcome, the welcome. Uh, but no, it's not the welcome. This is not our actual welcome. Our, our actual, this is the announcement of the welcome. <laughs> the welcome that you're gonna give one another later on during the fellowship hour. And I'm gonna, we'll have a moment for an appetizer welcome in just a second. But welcome is certainly more than me standing up here and saying welcome. Welcome is when we build community, when we do a deep welcome. We have a, a little appetizer coming up. I'm gonna ask you to stand and greet one another. But the full meal welcome, the deep welcome, that happens later on after the service. I, I sure hope you'll join us. That's where we gather together and get a chance to talk and, and form relationships. That's the real welcome. This is the announcement that we do welcome. And we are so glad you're here. And we hope that every person who's walked through the doors this morning does feel welcome and will get to form new relationships with other people. So thank you all for the gift of your presence. It means so much. I've seen new faces out here every Sunday, faces I haven't seen in a long time. So it is a delight, a real delight to be gathered together again. Thank you. Edward Everett, American author and Unitarian clergyman, said, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can. And together, we can do so much. Please join me in saying our affirmation. Love is our doctrine. Compassion is our way. Here we seek to create a joyful home for free religious exploration, build a community of caring fellowship, nurture the hopes, and serve the needs of our world.
Today we have some guest chalice lighters. Freya and her dad, Kevin, will be joining us. The flaming chalice is the official symbol of Unitarian Universalism. It was originally a sign of refuge for those escaping Nazi persecution. Today, may the chalices being kindled in UU churches, congregations, and fellowships around the world, including the chalices we light here in our sanctuary, be beacons of refuge and hope to all those who are experiencing persecution and the ravages of war. It is our tradition here at UUCS to light three chalices. And our first is for this congregation, its members, its friends, and everyone in our hearts. The second is for our partner church in Sheman Fava, Transylvania, Romania. And we hope that they remain safe as the conflict rages across their border. And the third is for the children and youth, as they will inherit the world that we make for them. Thank you very much, Freya. You can just blow that out. Oh, it'll get, it'll catch. Thank you. Well done. Please join me in singing the flame into life. Good morning. Can everybody young or young at heart please join me up here for a story? Today we are wearing green for the promise to grow by exploring what is right and true in life. We are also learning about renewing faith in each other by joining each other and joining forces for the common good. Together, we can change the world. And this, is, uh, this book is called Yes, We Can. Little Rue was chasing leaves one windy day. Rue's friends, Country Mouse and Quaker Duck, Quacker Duck, were waiting to play with him. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let's make a big pile of leaves, said Rue. A mountain of leaves, said Country Mouse. The biggest ever seen, Quack Duck. They began to collect up all the leaves they could find, but making a leaf mountain is hard work. So after a while, they stopped for a rest. While they were resting, little Rue said to his friend, Duck, I know something you can't do. You can't jump over a big, big log. Yes, I can, said the duck. The duck tried as hard as she could, but little ducks aren't made to jump over big, big logs. Country Mouse thought it was so funny when the duck fell over the fallen down tree. Don't you laugh at me, said the duck to Country Mouse. I know something you can't do. You can't float on a puddle. Yes, I can, said Country Mouse. So Country Mouse tried to float on the puddle. But Little Mouse isn't really made for floating. Little Rue thought it was so funny when Country Mouse crawled out of the water, soaking wet and dripping. Don't you laugh at me, said Country Mouse. I know something you can't do. You can't catch your own tail. Yes, I can, said Rue. 
Roo tried as hard as he could to catch his own tail, but his tail would not be caught. It was too far away. Country Mouse and the duck laughed, laughed and laughed and laughed as Roo ran around in circles. Mm -hmm. Don't you dare laugh at me, cried Roo. Well, you laughed at me, said Mouse. And you laughed at me, said Duck. No one was happy. No one was happy because each had made fun of someone else and someone else had made fun of them. Instead of making the biggest mountain of leaves that anyone had ever seen, they looked as if they might all go home in a bad mood. Little Rue's mother came over to see what the fuss was about. I'm not surprised the three of you look so grumpy, she said. Nobody likes to be laughed at. It was true. No one likes to be laughed at. Why don't you show each other what you can do, said Rue's mom. Rue cried, I can jump over a big, big log. He hopped up and over the fallen down tree. That's really good jumping, the others said. I can float on a puddle, said the duck, taking the water with ease. That's really excellent floating, the others agreed. And when Country Mouse caught his own tail, Little Roo and the duck thought that his tail catching was the best they had ever seen. <laughs> there now, said Roo's mother. Can we all be friends again? Little Roo, Country Mouse, and the duck looked at one another. They were all thinking the same thing. Yes, we can. The end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to let you know, any parents here with kids in the LRE program, uh, we have a survey for you to fill out uh, when you pick up today to uh, sign up for Parents' Night. So if you would like to join us for that, we would love to have you. And uh, yeah, just come find one of us and fill it on out. Thank you. If everybody can uh, stand up in the center to make the love arch, we'll be on our way. If you would just be in this moment now, be aware of your breath as it comes in and flows out. Just pause for a moment and be aware of the deeper, truer rhythms of our life. And become aware of the deep, well of compassion in your own heart. It's a compassion that you feel for all living beings who are born, who must suffer and die. Draw the clear waters of compassion from the well and share it with all who thirst. In this troubling hour, our hearts are especially attuned to the suffering in Ukraine, in Yemen, in Syria, the Congo, Afghanistan, and other lands where bombs fall and people grieve loss after loss. Let us be mindful of the deep well of compassion each of us has 
that we might draw from it in our daily lives, that we might share our compassion with others in our daily lives and around the world. Compassion is our way. And gratitude, gratitude. Walking down a neighborhood street, chatting on the phone, I see a tree, it's full of pink blossoms, it's spring. Two bright yellow finches select this moment to alight on the branches. They flit from one branch to another as though they are playing a game. One jumps to a branch and then another jumps to the new branch as though to checkmate that move. And so the bright yellow finches dance and dive amongst the pink blossoms. I don't feel like I deserved to behold this sight, but I sure feel grateful. Let us be mindful and aware of the everyday miracles of life and may our hearts fill with gratitude. For gratitude is our way. Good morning. I'm George Pitter. I'm your Lifeline Slate representative this morning. And uh, the contact information for our group is up on the slide on the wall right now if you need to get a hold of us for any reason. I have one concern and one joy to read this morning from Janet. Rental prices are prohibitive to single seniors. A frequent visitor is seeking a temporary rental. If you know of a private or shared space, please check the bulletin board in the hallway and contact Janet. And I have a joy from Ben Cavalletto. Lily Cavalletto turned 12 on Thursday. She had a slumber party in the fellowship hall Friday, with, Friday night with five of her friends. These kids grow up so fast I can't keep track. And I'd like to light one last candle for all the joys and concerns that weren't shared this morning. Thank you. We should think carefully 
about the reality of war. Most of us have been conditioned to regard military combat as exciting and glamorous, an opportunity for men to prove their competence and courage. Since armies are legal, we feel that war is acceptable. In general, nobody feels that war is criminal or that accepting it is a criminal attitude. By their very design, militaries are the single greatest violators of human rights. Whether their purpose is defensive or offensive, these vast, powerful organizations exist solely to kill human beings. There are people with destructions in, destructive intentions in every society, and the temptation to gain command can be overwhelming. Pursuing peace through military strength places a tremendous, wasteful burden on society. Governments spend vast sums on increasingly intricate weapons. Not only money, but also valuable energy and human intelligence is squandered while all that increases is fear. I want to make it clear, however, that although I am deeply opposed to war, I am not advocating appeasement. It is often necessary to take a strong stand to counter unjust aggression. Nevertheless, it is very difficult to assess such matters with any degree of accuracy. War is violence, and violence is unpredictable. At best, building arms to maintain peace serves only as a temporary measure. War is neither glamorous nor attractive. It is monstrous. Its very nature is one of tragedy and suffering. Thank you, Janet, for those words from the Dalai Lama. I'm sorry he couldn't be here this morning. Wouldn't that be great? We can use the presence of a lot of wonderful, peaceful people around us at times like this. and. The voice of his wisdom is, is always something I listen to. <clears throat> I was thinking this past week, my mind drifted back many, many years to 1957. That was the year that my father, who worked for the Red Cross, got stationed in an army base right outside of Straubing, Germany, which was close to the border with communist rule Czechoslovakia, just right over the hill, not far away. And the base that we lived on, it was a large base, but it was surrounded, the entire thing was surrounded by high barbed wire fence that separated us from the German countryside for security reasons. That was the year, 1957, if you remember, that the Soviets sent the Sputnik satellite into space. And there was widespread panic all across America and the West that the Soviet Union, the communists were gaining military superiority. Fearful talk of a possible war even found its way to my seven-year-old ears. I remember in the pre-dawn hours, you could hear the army tanks rolling out on their maneuvers in possible preparation for war. It was a very troubling sound to be woken up by that. And when I asked my dad if there was going to be a nuclear war, 
he said, yeah, there probably will be, oblivious of the impact this had upon me. Then he went off to play golf or something. That was my dad, sorry to say. Even then, after hearing this news, I imagined like a firecracker in a dirt clod, the whole world's going to be blown up. That's what I thought. And then, just a few years later, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it really seemed like a bomb might be headed my family's way. At the time, we were living in Columbus, Georgia, near Fort Benning, Georgia, which was a, the largest infantry training center in the world. It was a key military base, and everybody said, surely this will be on the Soviet nuclear hit list. Like many other folks in the neighborhood, and probably around the area, my folks stored some food in the hall closet in case of war. But we knew that a nuclear bomb, if it hit Fort Benning, would be blasted into nothingness or, or wish that we had been. I still remember how sad I felt when the teachers led us through nuclear war preparedness exercises during the Cuban Missile Crisis, they showed us how to hide under our desks and how we could only leave, we practiced it, we can only leave, they, they did a practice. Now we hide under our desks, the bomb drops, when do you leave when your parents come to get you? Let's practice that. And so they'd have a, a practice parent come pick us up and, you know, and you, the rest of us would be sitting there waiting for our parents, feeling like orphans. It was a terrible a terrible thing to do to children. And it was a profoundly unsettling thing for me. It made me feel so sad. I, I knew that my parents would probably die. They, they both worked at Fort Benning, and I just felt like an orphan even at that moment. We feared a nuclear war would come, and we're still here. It didn't come. It's because of the fear of mutual destruction that has held the superpowers in check. Both sides, all sides now that have nuclear weapons know that there's not gonna be a victor in a nuclear war. So the vast power of this horrible destruction has not been unleashed since the end of World War II when our nation dropped two bombs on Japan, something that's open for endless debate but a questionable move. Thank goodness that there have been no other atomic bombs. But I am sorry that I had to grow up feeling like the world was going to end. And so I felt a special obligation not to burden younger generations, especially children, with doomsday narratives claiming that nuclear war is inevitable. Yes, the threat of a nuclear exchange is a real concern, but there are also always possibilities for better outcomes. And it's important for us, for anybody who can, to embrace a spiritual narrative that will lead us to have a sense of hope for humankind's future. That's one of the key roles of life-affirming religious community, keeping the flame of hope alive, especially during dark times. But how can you Envision a hopeful narrative right now at such a time as this. Vladimir Putin's attack on Ukraine. I don't say a Russian attack. I say Vladimir Putin. He's the one that's made it happen. The Russians are joining in and fighting this war, but it was his idea. It's placed Western nations in a very difficult spot. And we have to ask, some of us are wondering, is this 1938 all over again? If you remember your history, that was when Germany began its aggressive campaigns of conquest while the West tried to placate Hitler and achieve peace, all to no avail. Is our current crisis a prelude to a more widespread conflict? Or are we going to find a way to keep this conflict from spreading? Will the democratic nations find the strength to counter the alarming spread of authoritarian and totalitarian regimes around the world. Just as in 1938, we face a criminal regime led by an autocrat whose only God is raw power, who seeks to expand his empire, 
who is devoid of moral constraints, having poisoned and jailed his challengers, bombed towns and villages. He has the blood of thousands and thousands of people upon his hands, his hands. His primary goal in the international arena, a goal in which he has achieved notable success, is to destroy democracy however he can, especially democracy in America. And ironically, much of the funding for these acts of aggression comes directly from those he seeks to subvert, the democratic countries that pay billions to Russia for fossil fuels. Putin believes, he really believes in authoritarian rule. He believes people are not capable of ruling themselves. They have to be ruled by a strong man, authoritarian. And if he is successful, I don't think he's going to be, but if he is successful in conquering Ukraine, this will wreck the international order. It will embolden other authoritarians around the world who are currently dismantling the democracies that enable them to come into power in the first place. I'm talking about countries like India and Turkey and Hungary. Those democracies are in bad shape. And if authoritarian and totalitarian forces do prevail in our world, if these forces do prevail in our world, it will be a world unfit for free people to live in. In truth, the democratic world order has not been very fit and healthy in recent times. Democratic countries have allowed economic and raw political interests to trump the protection and promotion of democracy Democracies have turned inward, become complacent, disengaged from the world scene as authoritarians' tentacles reach ever outward. Especially with modern technology, surveillance technology, it's a scary thing to think about what the governments will be able to do to control their citizens. In our own country, democracy has greatly degenerated in the past few decades. We lack a common vision, a common sense of purpose. We're a fractured nation in many ways. Our purported democratic system more often resembles an oligarchy ruled by the wealthy than a democracy. And so people are naturally cynical about the whole business of democracy because it is, it is often subverted by narrow interests again and again. Then too, our country has dealt itself mortal blows by misbegotten wars in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Vietnam, and other places at well that did not serve the cause of democracy, but rather the enrichment and entrenchment of a military industrial complex that takes away so much of our resources it could be better applied in so many other places. Too often, we have heard the term collateral damage. You hear that term? Collater there was some collateral damage in this drone strike. What that means is civilians were killed. Women and children were killed by our government. We use that language to paper over the civilian deaths we have caused in these wars. Faith in our government and in our system is at a low ebb. Cultural elites of our country have lost faith in our system and often express their hatred of it. They despise it. And while many on the other side of the political spectrum are flirting with nationalism and authoritarianism and trying to dismantle our democracy, so many have lost faith in the core of goodness. The core, there is a core of goodness at the heart of the American dream a dream of an inclusive country comprised of pilgrims from all corners of the world, a country where the disparate rivers of humankind flow together in a common sea of meaning and purpose, where everyone belongs, everyone has a fair chance and can thrive. That's the beautiful dream of America. One of my favorite sights is when I'm seeing citizens from around the world 
they all look different, but they're all becoming Americans, and I love that when I see them becoming citizens of the world. It's just a beautiful sight that people come to choose here to thrive. And so we've lost that vision. So many have lost that vision of democracy and the importance of democracy. If you looked in, and uh, you don't have to do it right now, but if you looked in the front of our hymnal, you would see that we have our purposes and principles. We have our seven principles listed. And the fifth one is that we covenant to affirm and promote the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. We promote this value of democracy. Why? Because democracy is a spiritual matter. It's a spiritual matter because when people are not free, they cannot be whole. They cannot have a voice or their fair share of power through an honest vote. Democracy. It's ugly, it's messy, it's the worst form of government, except for all the others. It's the only system that affirms the inherent worth and dignity of every person. It is the only system that does that. It's vital that we protect and preserve the dream of democracy in our world. Consider the role that the Allies played during World War II. What if they had not countered the fascist forces that were committing untold crimes against humanity, what the Germans were doing to the Jews and the Japanese were doing to the Koreans and the Chinese. It was dreadful, dreadful stuff. They had no moral compunctions to stop doing it. What if they had won the war? What a dreadful world that would be. But before the war, during the 1930s, during the gathering storm, the liberal churches leaned towards pacifism. And this made complete sense because this was in response to the many precious young lives that were sacrificed for no apparent reason. Nobody wanted to see another war. Remember World War I, they said, all that for nothing, all that for nothing. And so the churches were leaning pacifist. But there was one American preacher and theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, who began his ministry as a pacifist, but then he took a more realistic look at the darker side of human nature, and he recognized, before many others did, that Hitler was a real threat. He was not a pompous buffoon. If we were living in the 1930s, I think a lot of us would just laugh at this guy. But some people said, no, he's, he's a pompous buffoon, but he's also a great danger. And when Reinhold Niebuhr saw what Hitler was up to, he recognized this man is a real threat, not a pompous buffoon. He should be not be appeased, but should be confronted with military force. The sooner the better. Niebuhr was what was called a Christian realist, that is, somebody who recognized the tragic necessity of war at certain moments in history. And after the war, after World War II, when they saw what the Holocaust had done, what that was like, many of the liberals who had earlier ex professed pacifism realized that they had been naive in their theological outlook and had failed to grasp the enormity of the challenge that Hitler presented. I remember a similar transformation too. The great 19th century abolitionist Unitarian minister Samuel J. May, you know he's my great hero, Samuel J. May, I love this guy, 19th century abolitionist. He dedicated practically his entire life to helping for the eradication of slavery. And he underwent a painful transformation when the Civil War broke out because May was an avowed pacifist. He had nonviolently opposed the evil of chattel slavery for decades. But then when the Civil War finally broke out, 
When he saw the bodies of young men he knew and loved coming home in caskets, fighting to help eradicate slavery, he became a realist. And he supported the war as tragically necessary to end slavery. All of which begs the question, how should we regard the threat today? Not in the 1930s, but is this 1938 all over again? How should we regard the threat that Putin poses? One historian at Johns Hopkins University notes that Putin's trajectory increasingly resembles that of Hitler. Both men came to power after their countries experienced imperial dismemberment and economic collapse. Both promised to revive their nation's glory and enjoyed enormous popularity. Both militarized and pursued state capitalism. Both relied on the army and secret police. Both identified their nations with themselves. Both promoted reactionary ideologies that identified one nation, the Jews for Hitler, Ukrainians for Putin, as the enemy. Both used their national minorities living in neighboring states as pretexts for expansion. Both were also consummate liars and had deranged personalities. Hope that doesn't hurt their feelings. In this scheme of things, Putin's invasion of Ukraine is equivalent to Hitler's attack on Austria, Czechoslovakia, or Poland. And we all know what happened afterwards. There's a German word, I can't say it. It's a war of annihilation. That's what followed after that. But we don't know what's going to happen as this war in Ukraine winds on. The German military, they stormed in with their blitzkrieg, and the Russians don't seem to have mastered that. Did you know that the Germans in their blitzkrieg were given crystal meth for t the whole time? They, they were on, they were high, they were aggressive and so mean. And, and that was one of the reasons. It seemed like the Russian military is experiencing great difficulties as this war wears on. And it's hard to even imagine how much the Ukrainian people are suffering. But you have to admire their courage. It seems that they know the value of democracy more than those of us who have never had to fight for it. Considering Putin's goal of restoring the former Russian Empire, many say that it's naive to imagine that this Ukrainian conquest will satisfy this war criminal's appetite. Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, has gotten into trouble for calling Putin a war criminal. Oh my goodness, <laughs> he is a war criminal. People point out that the Baltic states, Lithuania, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and other states in Eastern Europe that lived under Soviet domination for decades, they could be next. That is, if the democratic nations don't stop Putin now, they say, it might be harder to do so later on. I feel so conflicted about the use of military force and all that that entails. Yet what do you do when a foreign military force threatens to take innocent lives? In response to such situations, long ago, early church father Augustine, St. Augustine, he first formulated what is called the just war doctrine, which, is, which says that the use of state-sanctioned violence is morally justifiable if it is absolutely necessary, absolutely necessary, to protect the innocent. I remember that as a young man. During the Vietnam War, Vietnam War was going, I was in college, I was losing my student deferment, I was gonna get drafted. I declared myself to be a conscientious objector Thankfully, things got all messed up with the draft board and, and Nixon suspended the draft for a while when I could have been drafted. I actually did get drafted and then I got a, a, an extension of my student deferment. But if I had had to go before the draft board in Columbus, Georgia and defend my pacifist philosophy, they would have nailed me. Because 
I was against the war in Vietnam. I didn't want to go over there and shoot people and kill people that I didn't know for a reason I couldn't understand. But so I was against that war and I, I thought that meant I was a pacifist. But then the more I have thought about it, I have discovered I don't want to put that label on myself. I can't be, I can't say that I'm a complete pacifist because I would protect somebody I love from great harm. I would use force to protect somebody I love from great harm. So I have struggled with this just like everybody does. And you realize that once you choose to use force, the genie gets out of the bottle and things spin out of control. And just war theory is the slipperiest theory that's ever come along because everybody uses it to justify their aggression. They say, they're about to attack me, so to protect myself, I have to attack them first. You see how it can be used? You can twist this theory all out of shape to justify your own aggression. Indeed, that's what Putin is doing. He's claiming that he's invading Ukraine to protect Russians who are being genocidally exterminated by Ukrainians. What a crazy, brazen lie. The fearsome danger that we face is that we don't know what is this autocrat who appears to be losing a war and knows his political survival hinges on avoiding defeat. What's he going to do next? He has nuclear weapons at his command. And many speculate that he might be tempted to use a so-called tactical nuclear weapon. What a name for a bomb like that. It's tactical. It's a bomb that would be devastating in its effect, but less than a full-scale nuclear bomb. But if such a dreadful escalation happens in the use of this weapon we will face the greatest challenge of our time because it's going to be supremely challenging to keep things from spinning out of control. Putin has purposefully cast the grim vision of this possibility before our eyes as a threat to stay the hand of Western support for Ukraine. And it has worked to some extent. We don't have a no-fly, there's, no, there's not a no-fly zone and we're not transferring jets to the Ukraine, not yet. Many lethal weapons, however, are finding their way into the Ukraine and the Ukrainian military is really putting up quite a fight, much more than people expected. It turns out that Putin underestimated this people's desire for freedom and democracy. Ukrainians have turned toward the democratic West rather than authoritarian Russia, and they are fighting on their home turf for their freedom. And this could prob probably go on for some time. And the tragic la losses are going to mount. Just a couple of days ago, I saw some footage of funerals of young Russian soldiers. Their wives and their families were in tears as they wept over the caskets of these soldiers who had died, untold numbers of young men who did not volunteer to fight for the twisted vision of a cruel autocrat have now laid down their lives, and more lives will be sacrificed. Meanwhile, Russian shells rain down on hospitals and other civilian targets in Ukraine, just as they rain down on the citizens of Syria that were bombed by the Russians to prop up a dictator, and just as they rained down on Grozny, Chechnya, until that town, Grozny, was reduced to rubble and became designated the most bombed city in the world. That's what the Russians do when they want to take over a place. They just bomb the hell out of it. How many U Ukrainian children have died? We've seen those bombs hitting the hospitals, and killing children. How many people have lost everything? Given Russia's shocking record of violence, we can expect similar levels of destruction as we saw in Chechnya to also happen in Ukraine. I just heard yesterday something really alarming. They said that the Russians are now beginning to use hypersonic missiles 
to knock out any target. Missiles that fly so fast that they can evade all radar detection. This is the first time, to my knowledge, that such weaponry has been used in war, and it's a dangerous escalation. And we have to wonder how much further are things going to get out of hand and escalate? Well, I obviously don't have the answer to that. I can't get inside Putin's calculating mind. And you wonder, is he cruel and rational or cruel and irrational? Those are the two choices, really. Even the most high-level po foreign policy experts don't know how far he's going to go. Perhaps Putin himself doesn't even know how he will act under duress, the duress that will come as his aggressive war begins to fail. Ah, welcome to life in the world with nuclear weapons. Bad actors have their hands on nuclear buttons. And the list of bad actors with nuclear weapon, weapons threatens to grow larger, irrespective of what Putin decides to do. And it's a threat that we will continue to live with, just as we have lived with it since before most of us were even born for many decades. We are living in a time of uncertainty. It feels like, to me, sort of like another variation of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which, if you remember, who remembers the Cuban Missile Crisis? Yeah. How many of you survived the Cuban Missile Crisis? <laughs> I like that. I like that. We all survived the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think we're going to survive this, too, I believe in my heart, for several reasons. First, just military calculation, the, as shocking as was his invasion of Ukraine, I think Putin will realize that first use of a tactical nuclear weapon would bring about his own eventual destruction. I don't think it's a way out for him to escalate in this fashion. What is useful for him is to threaten to use such weapons, not their actual use, on a country he hopes to incorporate back into Russia. This is not some foreign country on the other side of the world. This is a country neighboring Russia. And I don't think he would want to drop nuclear weapons on that country. And I hope I'm right. But more importantly than what's going on inside Vladimir Putin's head, I see cause for hope. Because when we are truly challenged, it can bring out the rest, the best in us. Just following a vote on Ukrainian aid in the Congress. Congress, which usually just, oh, we, we can't decide anything because half of us are for this and half of us are against it. And we're just perpetually paralyzed. But in this case, almost unanimous vote. Yes, let's get this thing going. There are more important things than our little internecine squabbles here in the United States. Years ago, such a threat, remember? Well, we don't, but we know our history. This brought out the threat of fascist takeover of the world did eventually bring out our nation's best when we defeated fascist forces in Germany and Japan. And in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I like what Ben Rhodes, a former member of the Obama administration has noted. He's, he starts out saying, you should be rightfully outraged by this unprovoked act of aggression against a free nation. And then he says, out of this righteous rage, shaking democracies from complacency, forcing citizens to discard the luxury of cynicism, rejecting the inevitability of autocracy, perhaps a new world can be born. We have reached a hinge of history, he writes, that's a phrase that really caught me. We have reached a hinge of history. Things will turn one way or the other. And it, at issue is not just the future of Ukraine, but that of the world that will emerge on the other side of this war. If we heed the lessons of this moment, he writes, we can rebuild from the rubble a renewed international order that once again places democratic values over the more transitory impulses for profit and immediate gratification. And if we don't, things could get much worse. Perhaps they will get much worse for a time. 
It's a frightening time. And yet, there have been frightening times before us. And it's in such times that we discover our courage and our love of freedom. At such moments as this, I remember the words of Mahatma Gandhi, who said that when I despair, Gandhi despairs, I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love have always won. There have been tyrants and murderers for a time. They can seem invincible, but in the end, they always fall. Think of it. Always. Always. As for me, I have always chafed at this. There's a passage in Ecclesiastes, and we're going to do a deeper dive into Ecclesiastes next Sunday. But there's that passage in Ecclesiastes that says, and there is a time for war. I don't like this passage because it seems to affirm the inevitability of war. Today, as a realist, I must acknowledge that this is a season of war in many parts of the world, including the Ukraine. But let's not also forget wars in other parts of the world, in Africa and South America, Asia and the Middle East. The brutal war in Yemen is the one that's been catching my attention for the past several years. So much suffering in that poor country. This is a season of war. Ecclesiastes was right. But I dream of a day when there will be no more such seasons. I remember and am heartened by the ancient vision of the Hebrew prophets who looked into the heart of reality and they caught a glimpse of a future age and they proclaimed, in this future age they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. May it be so. Will you join me in a time of prayerful reflection? We live during perilous times. And yet it is in the midst of peril that we discover the depth of our love and our caring and our connection for one another. It is in such moments when war is raging that the dream of peace is rekindled in our hearts. During this time when so many are suffering, we are awakened to the tragedy that unfolds before us. And our hearts yearn to do that which will bring peace. And so here we live on this far northwestern corner, so far away from the conflict on the other side of the world. And yet it is close. It is close. May we lift our hearts in a spirit of courage and love as we move through these times, let us remember that we have one another for counsel and support. Let us remember that we are not alone. Let us remember to cherish the dreams of the generations who sought freedom and let that dream remain alive for us today and for the Ukrainian people and for all people in all lands. May it be so. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Each week, we ask you to offer your financial support to this compassionate community. It is our tradition to share the gifts we receive during this time each Sunday. However, today, in light of the dire situation 
happening in Ukraine, we will be giving 100% of the funds collected today to the International Women's Convocation of UUs, who are supporting our Transylvanian Unitarian Partners' efforts to provide immediate relief to Ukrainian refugees who cross into Romania. As always, we will be accepting donations to the Marion Polk Food Share in the little red wagon that's coming to the front. The baskets will be passed in the sanctuary. For those watching online, you may donate by logging on to uusalem.org and following the prompts. Thank you for your generosity. Reverend Rick has brought forward the Social Justice Lantern. As most of you know, we light this lantern each week from our community chalice. This is a symbol of the light that each of you takes out into the world. As we extinguish our chalices at the close of each Sunday service, it's common for us to remind you that the spark, the light, and the warmth is still burning still present in your heart. This week, I hope that you will take that spark and kindle a flame, a chalice, or even a bonfire that will act as a beacon of hope to all 
who are experiencing fear and loss and hopelessness. Hello, I've been invited to take two or three minutes of your time to talk about what the church means to me. I'm glad they gave me a clear limit because I could go on a lot longer than that. <laughs> I do respect your time and I spent as much time editing as I did writing. If you need to stand up and stretch, I know you've been seated for a while. I can talk right over you. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Ben Cavaletto. I've been a member here since the fall of 2015. Right now, I'm the chair of the Lifespan Religious Education Team. I'm a coordinator for the men's group, and I'm accepting a nomination to join the board of directors this July. But back in 2015, I wasn't part of any teams. For the first four years that I attended here, I came as a person in need. My children were then five and three years old, and my work of supporting my family and nurturing my marriage came with a lot of stress. I needed community and I needed support and both of those I received here in abundance. I remember the first Sunday we attended when I was warmly greeted by Johnny and Laurelyn. Reverend Rick talked about the welcome that's coming for you. We made friends with a handful of other families and within that first year the four of us were attending family outings at the park, a barbecue by the pool, playing party games in the living rooms of our new friends. Church services felt like an hour of retreat for me. It really helped that I knew my children were enjoying themselves among trusted adults, and that my kids enjoyed being here, lighting the chalice, eating coffee hour treats, playing with new friends, singing songs and making art, and hugging people who were excited to see them here each week. During the service, I appreciated the music, the ritual, and the inspiration to be more and to give more of myself to others. I remember wanting to volunteer more and to give more, but not feeling that I had much more in me. I shared this desire with others and people told me it was okay. Things happen in their season. So during the first four years of attending, I volunteered the bare minimum in RE and I didn't join any teams. Instead, I got moral support from lifelines and from Compassionate Connections. I attended a Soul Matters group to spend time with other adults. I joined my first UU men's retreat where I met Steve Rosen and began a very important friendship, filling a void that I had for a close male friend. Thankfully, in the last two and a half years, I've had a lot more ability to give. I joined the LRE team because I wanted there to be a strong teen pro for when my kids were old enough. I started coordinating the men's group because I wanted to schedule the meetings to fit on the weekends when I didn't have the kids. <laughs> I increased my yearly pledge each year because I was in a better position to do so. Throughout COVID, it was volunteering in men's group, LRE, and captioning the service that kept me connected to the community. If you are struggling right now, maybe just holding it together, and don't think you have a lot more to give, I want to be the one to tell you that's okay. Things happen in their season. There are some people here who might know what you're going through. I have come to know members here who give of themselves so generously. Now that I have more ability, I'm happy to be joining them, paying it forward. I hope you'll join me and all of us who are giving generously to make this amazing place be the loving community that we all need. You rock, Ben Cavalletto. We love you so much. We're so grateful for all you offer us <laughs> in our congregation. I had, I had a question for the choir. Are you guys receiving new members or are you full? Or, or would you be willing to, would you be willing to accept new members? Okay, 
So I am so, you guys were so beautiful this morning. It was so good to hear you. And I just want to remind the rest of the congregation that singing is good for your spiritual health and it's good for our spiritual health to hear it. So if you're thinking you might like to join a choir sometime, go up and talk to them and they'll, they, they say they have some openings. So let's remember that. I'm also going to announce a class that we have coming up or an experience, a four-week experience. It's called Starting Point. It's for newer people in the congregation, but if you've been around a long time, hey, you could join it too. It's going to be starting on April 3rd, 10th, 17th, and whatever comes after that. I don't, I don't know my math, but anyway, all those four Sundays in a row. And uh, from 12 to 2, we're going to meet here. We're going to have lunch. There will be child care provided. We're going to get to know one another. We're going to get to learn about this religious tradition that gave birth to this congregation and our own personal stories as well. So I hope we have a chance to do that. So I forgot to do something earlier in the service, and it just occurred to me. I want to do it right now. Would you guys everybody just sort of stand and greet one another for a second and then I'm going to stop it and we're going to go back to the, we're just going to insert as though that happened earlier so just take a moment to say hi to the people around you <laughs> Okay, that's good enough. I'm just get, this is just an appetizer, not the whole meal. This is an appetizer, so you'll be uh, energized to get to know other people during the fellowship hour. I hope you will have a chance to have a significant uh, interaction with people during that time. So um, there are other things happening in the community, so please do look at the website and, and figure out where you can fit in. There's lots going on here, but I especially wanted you to know about that class that will be starting soon. So that's it for me. Thanks.
please remain standing and join with me in saying our closing words. May faith in the spirit of life, hope for the community of earth, and love for the sacred in one another be ours now and in all the days to come.